to you. Today we bring an offering of, of joy and love and worship to you. You, Lord, who have paved the way for us at the cross and never abandoned us, Lord God, but made the way for us to be here today, living free, loving you, and knowing that we are loved in return. We love you, Lord. We thank you for life, for joy, for fellowship and friendship, and for hope. Bless us as we look at your word and look at your, your life and how it impacts us and find peace and comfort and joy and hope. Bless us in these things, precious Jesus. Be glorified in what we say and do. Amen. Amen. Happy Sunday, friends. <clears throat>
it's great to be here. I'm going to look around like imagining that some of you are, are here. Although, <clears throat> as you know, uh, we are a near empty church. You know, it occurred to me this week <clears throat> that uh, we are really living through a time of sort of massive doldrums. Your parents probably had words that they used that that were peculiar to your family. Uh, you didn't hear everybody's family saying, my dad had some words that uh, we never were repeating. So it's New Word Sunday, and uh, we're going to have some new words. Doldrums, a state or period of inactivity or stagnation or depression. Mm. So that was what crossed my mind. I thought, man, we got, I've just got the doldrums today. I think the whole world has the doldrums over this coronavirus, invisible enemy. So I had to look up, you know. Yeah, but where's the word doldrums come from? Doldrums, doldrums is an equatorial region of the Atlantic with deadly calms. Sailors would sail into it and the wind would be gone. They could die there. Or a sudden deadly storm, okay? The, the north and south trade winds border the doldrums. And the air circulates upwards in the doldrums because they're right there over the equator. So that the area has no surface wind, but sudden hurricanes and thunderstorms come up. So that's what the doldrums are. Our doldrums are named for. You know, your grandma, my, my, my grandma and my mom, I'm sure, used... The, that word doldrums. I don't know. Maybe they were readers of Robert Louis Stevenson. He wrote a bunch about pirates, swashbucklers. The first reading for today is from John 20, 19 through 31. We've just come off of Easter. Jesus is now walking through walls, scaring people to death. Not to death, but shaking them up. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed upon them, and he said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now, he wasn't saying that they are like God, and God is the only one who can forgive sins, but that they have the capacity to go and proclaim the truth of salvation or eternal damnation. That's what he was saying to them. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails on his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and, the, and in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with him. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came, walked through the wall, and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and, and see my hands. Reach your hand in and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Thomas is the first one among all the twelve to call him God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have not seen me? And yet, you have come to believe. Blessed are, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. He's referring to us and others who didn't need that bit of evidence. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. 
But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing you may have life in his name. So what's with all the doubting? Doubting Thomas, doubting Peter who said, I do not know the man. Doubting Saul, who became Paul 30 years later. I think they had some doldrums going on. I think maybe when it feels like you've lost what matters most to you in life, it's just difficult to see hope through the fog of despair. I know some of you are feeling that even now. Jesus felt some of that. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He knew God had not abandoned him, but he could not feel the closeness of the Father, which he had felt every moment of his existence prior to the cross. And so he felt that. He felt the doldrums of the soul. Thomas is grieving the only hope of Israel, snatched away and murdered. How could this happen? He was stronger than anything. He was mightier than anything. He could answer anything. Peter just watched his Lord lay down by his water bowl and let lesser men defeat him. Peter, who wasn't defeated by anybody, he just watched Jesus succumb to the evil in the world and seemed to let them get a leg up. Saul of Tarsus, 30 years later, Saul's the one that was murdering Christians because he was sure that this Christian movement was against God, against God that we know, God the Father. He missed the whole point of Jesus, but he knew God. And what he thought was, these people are ruining, they're, they're going to ruin the world. They're like the, the Antichrist, but not Christ. Saul of Tarsus saw what he imagined was the rise of the Antichrist, and he would die or kill to prevent it. And he did. The God of Israel was everything to Saul. It was a seesaw of emotions and events that precipitated each denial. The triumphant injury on Palm Sunday, Jesus' ministry in Jerusalem, but then the spooky language at Passover, and the sweating blood in the garden, and then the troops seizing Jesus, and the accusations, and the beatings, and the floggings, and the guilty verdict, and the cross. They couldn't even watch, most of them. Savior of the world, and he wouldn't save himself. Now the women and the men want us to believe that, and some men want us to believe that it didn't happen or that he's alive and risen. I think Thomas was saying, my, my heart won't endure another, another heartbreak like that. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not up, I'm not up for another setback. Paradigms. It's a word we don't hear a lot. A paradigm is a standard or perspective or a set of ideas. We make assumptions and make plans and view life based upon our beliefs. People who study people call these paradigms. Standards, perspectives, or a set of ideas. Example, someone grows up being taught that another people group are less important or less intelligent um, or not to be bothered with, only to grow up and learn otherwise. Wow, well, that, that was, that, I've, I've thought that all my life. That is a paradigm shift. When something that we held true and made decisions regarding is suddenly found to be not true, but we have another view now. My, my college professor was raised believing that the Holy Spirit was not in the Catholic Church. And I'm gonna, I have to believe that the people that raised him were nice people. He, he's a very wonderful man. Um, but they, 
for some reason believed that the Holy Spirit did not reside in the Catholic Church. So he grew up thinking that, even though he was a very nice fella. And uh, he made a sales call one day on a Catholic church. And when he walked in, the choir was singing in the Spirit. Now, that means they're not following any, any page, anything printed. They're singing in the Spirit in a worshipful way. And the Holy Spirit moves across a room and, and in the hearts of people when that occurs. <laughs> So this spirit-filled man walked into this place and they're, they're praying in the spirit and the Holy Spirit suddenly was so profound in, in his presence in this Catholic church that he excused himself to go to the bathroom where he could weep, he could cry his eyes out and repent for having been wrong about that all of his life. It wasn't his fault, he was taught it, but he repented for that. That was a paradigm shift for him. For Thomas and for Peter, they were, they were in for a paradigm shift. And they were having all sorts of shifts. They believed that Jesus was infallible. Well, he is. But when he was beaten and put on the cross, he sure didn't look infallible. So there was a shifting of, of a paradigm there. Of, okay, he's human like us and and now he's dead. Well, now he's risen from the dead. Paradigm shift. Okay, he's eternal. But how? I don't know how that works. <laughs> God is able. Oh, no, he's dead. Wait, he's alive. And in the years to come, Saul, who became Paul, would write to the Hebrews. Hebrews 11.6 And without faith it is impossible to please God for whoever would draw near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And that would require trust. There's an expression that Ronald Reagan learned from a, an American writer. She schooled him on um, things Russian. It's a Russian proverb it goes, trust, but verify. That was something you heard him say, uh, or you, uh, that's written that he spoke when, it was, when, when, when they were trying to get a, a handle on the, the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Trust, but verify. Uh, we're going to deal with these people in a, in a, a way of accept, taking their word on things, but we're going to verify it. Trusting God means that we don't have to verify. God is able. God is willing. God is for us. God is all-knowing. God's timing is perfect. He is working a perfect plan. He wishes that not one would be lost. He cares about every detail of my life. Now multiply that by the world population. God is orchestrating all things throughout the entire world for each of us. And now consider that when you think about the coronavirus and the impact worldwide. God is making all things beautiful in their time. He's inviting every living soul to salvation. He came to save the lost, to comfort those who mourn, to give rest to the weary, Psalm 147, 6 through 16 says, The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God with the lyre. I've not figured out how to play a lyre yet. He cares. He covers the heavens with clouds. Prepares rain for the earth. Makes grass grow on the hills. He gives the animals their food to the young ravens when they cry. He delights not in the strength of the horse, nor is his pleasure in the speed of the runner. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. Now, put a thumb there. Hold the phone. Not those who are horrified at the thought of him. <gasps> God. No. But rather reverence. 
He takes pleasure in those who revere him. In my growing up house, my parents were determined to be revered. Uh, we took them seriously or else we had a stingy rear. Reverence, my folks expected reverence, not fear, but reverence for their authority that kept us out of jail. God expects no less than that. Reverence, he is God and I'm not. He's in charge and I'm not. He's all loving and I'm not. He's completely trustworthy and I'm working on that, but I'm not. He is perfect. I'm not. He takes pleasure in me when I remember these things and when I hope in his steadfast love. If I don't trust God, then why would he trust me with anything? If I won't trust him, I should, expect, I should expect goose eggs, zilch, nada, nothing from him. Oh, he won't stop caring about me while I build a concrete tomb around my heart. He won't stop caring about me. Why should he trust me? I will choose trust. And he will not impose it. He can't make us trust him. James, brother of Jesus, wrote in his letter, My brethren, brothers and sisters, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be mature, and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him or her. But let him ask in faith, without doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man or woman suppose that they will receive anything from him. He, is a double, he or she is a double-minded man or woman unstable in all their ways. This scared the heck out of me when I first read it. I doubted all sorts of things. I doubted that everything would work out just great. You know, I might get a good job, but be careful. You know, you, uh, you could lose that job in a minute. Oh, you know, so I, I doubted some things and I wondered, I wondered if I was sort of out of the mainstream of faith. But I had to learn that Thomas doubted. Thomas doubted and Jesus made a special trip and explained things to him. Peter doubted. Jesus made another special trip. We'll talk about that another Sunday. Uh, a little breakfast on the shoreline. Saul refused to believe in Jesus until Jesus appeared to him. Each for his own reason disbelieved and they weren't punished for it. And they weren't abandoned or spit out. Each of them were seeking truth and righteousness in the run-up to their baptism in the Holy Spirit. And each of the three was the first among their contemporaries to call Jesus Lord. When the relationship matters, when the outcome When the relationship matters more than the outcome, we don't use trust but verify. We simply trust. Jesus asked lots of times, why do you doubt? He asked Peter, why, why, do you, why did you doubt when Peter started to sink into the water? Why do, why do doubts arise in your heart? Why are you so afraid? And why are why are you afraid? These are all Matthew 14, 31, Luke 24, 37, Mark 4, 40, and Matthew 8, 26. It's for us to hope in his steadfast love. We can't live out our days in the doldrums. The doldrums don't define the ocean and they can't define our lives. Well, it's New Word Sunday, and it's Two for Sunday. Two short messages, seemingly unrelated, for the price of one.
Care and feeding for a healthy, happy soul. That's what this is called. Care and feeding for a healthy, happy soul. How do you stay healthy and happy in, in, your, in your spiritual life? Well, here's a couple of suggestions, three to be exact. One, pray as much as you care. Hmm? Yeah. Let caring be your cue to pray. Now, this is interesting. I can care all day long without praying once. I can care. Oh, man, I sure care about this church. I, um, I sure care about uh, uh, Barb and Denise and Brenda and, and Terry and Amy and um, Alton and Christy and, and Beth. See, the, the, tr the problem with this is you, you leave somebody out and then they feel left out. I can care all day long about people and not pray once. I'm sure God likes that I care, and that's swell, but who am I helping? Goose eggs. Nice that I care, but God can turn a busy brain and a kindly heart into a robust friendship between him and me or him and you and a powerful partnership initiated by God and participated in by you or me for the benefit of others if we will let caring be our cue to pray. People get blessed, therefore, I, therefore pray for one another. The, the prayer of a righteous person has great power, James 5.16. Even people we've never met and don't know their trials or their circumstances If you care about them, pray for them. I've got a cousin that prays about uh, ambulances that go by. She prays for the person in the ambulance. God moves whenever we pray. He loves it when we care, but he acts when we pray. 1 John 5.14 says, And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, God's will, he will hear us. Colossians 4.2 Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Watchful. Watchful. How, how about being listenful? While you're praying out of your care and concern for someone, God can tell you his specific desire for that person and even tell you the specific situation that God is looking to change or, or, or make for them, make better for them. So be listenful, watchful. Jack Hayford, in, on one of his footnotes in Colossians 4.2 says, Give yourself constantly to prayer. Be watchful, listenful, and thankful, humble, and, and appreciative. Ask the Lord to teach you to pray and to increase your endurance and effectiveness. Remember, prayer is an exciting and incredibly fulfilling journey with God. Prayer frees us up to live in the context of a present victory and a future hope. Let that sink in. I'm walking, I'm living my life in a present victory. I don't feel victorious when I stub my toe. Oh, that doesn't, that's not a feeling of victory, but I'm walking in victory. I'm walking in the context of a victory. I'm living a victorious life. God loves me and I know it and I love him back. And life is going pretty good. Perfectly, actually. I'm walking as prayer frees me up to live in the context of a, per a present victory and a future hope. I don't have to sweat it about tomorrow. I need to plan properly, appropriately, sleep enough so I won't be exhausted. Simple things. But, but tomorrow and, and the rest of my the history is, is working out fine because God is in charge of it. I live in a present victory. I walk in a present victory with a future hope. That's because I've trusted my Lord. Prayer frees us up for that. Why? Because when we're praying more, there's little time for doubting or worry. If God is for me, who can prevail against me? Or second-guessing, 
You know, if I'm not in, in, in earshot of Amy, I, I, I can't hear what she's saying. And I, I never want to be a husband that just goes, well, sure, whatever you say. Yeah, go ahead. Um, same goes with God. Prayer puts us in earshot of God's heart for us and his directions. Just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights, so the Lord reproves and chastens him or her whom he loves. Psalm 3, 12. Now you want to understand that for what it is. The nearer that we are to God, the more that he can show us that's a wrong thing, Mark. Oh, thank you, Lord. I knew that, but I forgot. But we also, and, and in that is his love, because he wants us to walk a straight path, a path that, in which we would be blessed. Number two, and there are only three. Monitor your presentation. Number one is pray. Pray as much as you care. Number two, monitor your presentation. The fruits of the Spirit are the factory resets that are what we should be exhibiting, presenting, aspiring to, known for. If God has made his home with us, the Spirit living in me and you will be reflecting God's attributes and personality. They are love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and self-control. The presentation of God's Spirit, if I'm letting it, letting it in enough to, to let it out in what I say and do and think, are love, peace, joy, patience, I'm working on it, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, which is gentleness, and self-control. These are the factory resets of God's presence in you or me. And we only get reset if we monitor our presentations. If we just puff up and act out and say, well, that's just the way it is. Well, no, wait, that's not monitoring. You acted out. You said something that wasn't kind. Are you proud of that? I mean, if we'll ask ourselves, if we'll, if we'll keep a conscience so that we know we can do it, we can be wrong and we need to apologize and do better. These are the factory resets of God's presence in you and me. If any of them are lacking, we know we need to work through something. It's not because God's holding out. It's us resisting. Maintenance is the key here. Remember the Beatitudes. We've talked about these before. The Beatitudes are should be a description of, of each one of us. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those who mourn, for there should be, they should be comforted. The meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be filled. The merciful, we're all supposed to be merciful, because we shall obtain mercy. The pure in heart, best thing anybody can ever say about you. The pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is a kingdom in heaven, not a kingdom on earth. God gave us these as a pattern to heed while the world pulls us hard left of center, makes us angry about one thing and another, and nah, don't, go, don't go to sleep and you're angry. Blessed are the gentle. Blessed are the merciful. We have these promises to pull us back. And number three, care and feeding for a healthy, happy soul. Embrace the invisible. We have to embrace the invisible. The doldrums are all around us and they're, they're a very normal thing. They're, they're as normal as as anything. But we aspire to a miracle working 
all-powerful, almighty, all-loving God. And if we're not embracing the invisible, this is where Thomas was inept. The disciples, they, they were not embracing the invisible. So when the invisible showed up, um, it, it, it startled and frightened them. We have to embrace the invisible. We have 2,000 years since the cross to, to see God's working, to see the Holy Spirit in men and women building a church in the world, bringing souls, bringing people to hear the gospel so that souls are saved. All of you walking in, in victory because God cared enough to say, I want you in my family. And he proved it to you. So you gave your heart to him. You said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, that he died for my sins, was risen on the third day, and I'm spending the rest of my life with him. Here on earth for now, there in heaven in perfection. God is in control. Doesn't make me less sad when I see a little baby. Oh, this morning I saw a little baby in, in her sad mother's arms, and she's prevailing against a cancer. But boy, the picture made me sad, and I thought, oh, I gotta pray for this little girl. I looked a little further, and it was an old story. She has prevailed. But of course you can feel sad for a person's circumstances, but God is not taking a break on the beach in Jamaica. He's aware of all these things. Like I said, all those things times everybody in the world. God is aware of every circumstance, every situation, every heart, every hurt, every thought of every living individual. All in real time. Embrace the invisible. That's what we have. People that don't have the invisible, they find a gun or a knife and they hurt someone because that's the only power they can have. Or they check out or they put themselves in harm's way and, and they, they die because they didn't realize that life was precious. But it is. And we are precious or God would not have selected us to have a friendship. That's something that everyone needs to understand. You didn't choose God first. He chose you and me. And when we realized that because others did what they could do and because people prayed for us, when we realized that, we then made a decision to become His. If you haven't made that decision and you see in this video, I, am, I implore you to just take a moment and understand that God is not shocked by your lifestyle or by your activities in life. He, he saw them coming. If you have any sense that you're missing out on His love, that means that he's already reached out to you. And what you need to do is to close your eyes and say, Lord, please reveal yourself. And be honest, say, I'm, I'm, I'm frightened, Lord. I'm, I'm terrified. I'm, may, I'm angry. I'm all sorts of things inside, but I'm also lonely and lost. And I know there's got to be something better here for me than what I'm living and I promise you, if you will pray that prayer, if you will pray that prayer, God will introduce him to you in a way that you have never known. And you will never, your life will never be the same. You'll be something of the person you were, but with a greater love in your heart and a greater faith and a greater hope because you'll know that you're included. You're included. You know what else you'll figure out? That he accepts you exactly as you are. He doesn't agree with all that you do. And he wants better for you. But he loves you right where you're sitting. Stinky shoes and all. Lord, I thank you for anyone who will 
see this and be so determined, Lord, that or, 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 or so compelled to close our eyes and pray to you, Lord God. And I thank you for that. I thank you that by your power and by your love, you said you wish that not one would be lost. And perhaps there's one that's watching now and you're reaching out to that person. I celebrate that. I celebrate that. And I thank you, Lord, for the love that they feel in their hearts as you enter into their, their heart by invitation and redeem them from the sadness and the loneliness and the suffering of life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for salvation for those who will simply say, Lord, I'm lost. Show me where, show me who you are, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. What can I say but hallelujah? Thank you. We love you. Thank you for loving me first and, and wooing me so that I would come to know you. It took a lot of years to know you well, but I ask you for all of these, all of these things in these lessons, Lord God, for the maintenance, maintenance of a of a healthy and happy spirit. I ask for all these things for myself, not just for those who attend the church here, but for me as well, Lord God. I want discipline, and I invite you to, the, to do that, Lord. Bless us in these things, we ask in your precious and wonderful name, my Jesus, according to your will and word and the power of your blood. Amen. Amen. Love you so much, folks. Peace.